Thank you, thank you very much for having me, uh, even on this date. Uh, <laughs> we didn't realize that that would be the date. Uh, so let's just get going before the game starts. Um, so yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great pleasure to tell you all about my favorite uh, physics topic, which is nuclear astrophysics. And I realize it's not the obvious connection to make. Nuclei are tiny, and how could they be connected to the stars? And so hopefully by the end of today, uh, I'll clarify that. I will start with uh, telling you a little bit about the field and why we're excited and what, we're trying, what questions we're trying to answer. Um, and then I'll tell you about the tools we use to answer these questions. And these are the cyclotrons we have right now. It's the new accelerator we're building, FRIP. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you all about all of that. Uh, by the way, if you have questions during the talk, just feel free to, uh, to stop me and ask a question. Just the lights are really bright, so you have to just shout out my name and I will answer your questions. So let's get started this way. So in general, the field of nuclear astrophysics is trying to answer some very big and important questions like um, where are all these elements that we see around us, where are they coming from and where are they formed? Um, and this is actually what I'll be focusing on today. But it's other questions too, like how the stars evolve, how they produce their energy, how they explode. Um, there are different types of explosions. Sometimes it's just a single explosion, and sometimes the star might have a partner and slowly accumulate matter and then explode. Sometimes, like maybe you heard last year about the big uh, gravitational wave discovery and the two neutron stars merging, which is the picture up there. Again, how does that happen and what happens during an event like that? So these are the questions that we're trying to answer. Now, I am a nuclear physicist, so I'm trying to answer these questions by doing research in nuclei. So what we do, it's a very strong connection between the two fields. With astrophysics, we're identifying what's needed, what is happening inside that stellar environment, and all of the reactions that are happening. And then as an experimentalist, I will go to the lab and I will try to measure these quantities and figure out how they will affect the stellar environment. And I'll go back to the astrophysicists and say, this is what I found, how do, what do we learn from it? And they'll come back and say, no, let's try something else and something else is important and we go back and forth. So this is the big picture and this is the, the field. So I'll focus on the elements today. This is hopefully a picture everyone is familiar with, with the, the periodic table uh, of the elements. So we're trying to figure out where all of these elements are coming from. And it's, in general, the curiosity of, uh, you know, we have all these elements in the universe, all these elements in the solar system, where are they formed? But it's also, on top of this, it's our personal quest for understanding ourselves, right? We're wondering what's inside our bodies. We uh, care a lot about what we eat. And so, because all of that goes inside our bodies. Well, our bodies are also made of all of these elements. So it's one of the most fundamental questions we can ask, what, where are all the elements in our bodies coming from? So I wanted to make a connection uh, for that. This is a graph that shows the, different, the elements I showed from the previous slide, but how much of each element do we have in the universe? And you'll see at the bottom here, at the left hand, uh, that we have a lot of hydrogen. The scale here is not linear. It goes with 10, 100,000, so it increases very quickly. Uh, so the majority of the universe is hydrogen and helium, the first two bars. We also have some of the light elements down here. I marked carbon, oxygen, and so on. Um, we have some peaks and valleys in this graph, and the reasons for all of the peaks and valleys are coming from nuclear physics properties, and I will highlight that later on. We have a peak around iron. I'll tell you why all the heavy elements up here um, are a lot less because it's harder to make. And actually, a lot of the focus of today's talk is these heavy elements. So we have all of these elements, and we have a, this particular distribution of elements in the universe. And now, looking in our bodies, what is our body made of? Well, it's, if you start, it has a lot of water, 62% water. It has proteins. It has uh, fat. It has a lot of different things. If we dive a little bit deeper, all of these are actually different elements. And so it has a lot of carbon, a lot of oxygen, a lot of hydrogen, and a little bit of many other uh, elements. And actually, there's a lot that are not even listed on this chart, uh, but um, they're there. 
So what I was curious uh, to see how can I compare the composition of our bodies to the universe? Is it the same or are, are we special? Uh, is it some weird uh, coincidence that our bodies have a lot of carbon and oxygen and not much else? And so I just put this distribution of elements in our bodies on top of the, the universe distributed chain of elements, and they're basically the same. There are small differences. There are some elements we don't need. We don't need helium, <coughs> for example, so that second bar over there goes away. But <coughs> the majority of the distribution is the same. So it's not just that some of the elements are in our bodies are coming from the universe. We are the universe itself, which is just a very, it's an amazing thought if you think about it a little bit. So this is what we're trying to figure out, or one of the things we're trying to figure out. Where do all of these elements come from? So going back to the, the periodic table of the elements, um, let's start with the lightest elements. So the lightest of the elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, they're made during the Big Bang. And that's it. So if we had our periodic table of the elements uh, right after the Big Bang, it would be very easy to memorize just three elements. Um, but we wouldn't be here to memorize it because we need carbon and oxygen and all the other elements. And everything else, everything else is made in stars. So I'm telling you that everything else is made in stars. You can ask, how do we even know that everything else is made in stars? And I will show you that on this chart of uh, the periodic table of the elements, there's some elements that are this different color, the white color. And some of you might know why. The reason for the different color is that these elements are artificial elements. We cannot find them in nature naturally. So you can go out and find basically all the elements in, uh, on this chart except these heaviest ones and technetium. Technetium is an artificial element. And this is the first indication for how we know that the elements are made inside stars. So it's a story. Let me let, tell you a little bit of this story. It was in the early 1950s, and at that time, the science scene was that we were trying to figure out how the energy, uh, the energy production in our sun and the other stars, and at that point, people kind of figure out that probably some nuclear reactions are happening and they're producing energy, and probably that's what's pr producing all of this energy and fueling the stars, but they had no idea how that these processes also made uh, the heavier elements. The assumption at the time was that probably all these elements were made during the Big Bang. And this is where the shock came when Paul Merrill, so in this picture from Mount Wilson Observatory, observed for the first time lines of technetium in one of the stars that he was observing. And he even wrote it in the paper, which we don't usually put these things in papers, but he even wrote it in the paper that it was a huge surprise to see an artificial element in the lines. Because, and he gave two interpretations. Either there is actually a stable isotope of a technetium that we haven't discovered yet, or somehow the star itself is making technetium, which is also a big shock because we did not expect that either. Just to get an idea, technetium is an artificial element. Uh, its longest lived isotope lives for four million years. And so for a star that should be billions of years old, technetium should have decayed a very long time ago and it shouldn't be there if it was made during the Big Bang. But it was not. He, Paul Merrill saw these technetium lines and that was immediately the, the first hint or the first proof that this is where technetium had to be made and this is where the heavy elements had to be made. And very quickly, right after that, the field was born. Uh, by 1957, there, were, there was a comprehensive description of how all the astrophysical processes make all of the elements. And it, it's been changing since then and we're learning a lot of new things, but that was definitely the start. Okay, so I keep talking about elements. And I want to now make the transition to nuclei because this is, this is an important transition to make. So when we talk about how are the elements produced in stars, um, we, we are missing a little bit of the details because each of the elements has many different versions of itself that we call isotopes. 
So each of the elements, let's say I have the example up there of molybdenum. Molybdenum has 42 protons. So anything with 42 protons will be molybdenum and will have those chemical properties. But if I add different neutrons to molybdenum, it will look different. So I get these different isotopes. And I highlighted up here the different isotopes of molybdenum. It has uh, all the black ones are the stable isotopes. It has many stable isotopes. And any other color would be radioactive isotopes or exotic or rare isotopes as we call them. Um, so if I look in the universe for where all of these isotopes are made, uh, they are not made in the, at the same place. And so when in the question where the elements are made, I have to dig deeper and see where the isotopes are made. So to display that, we, in nuclear physics, we get that periodic table of the elements and kind of stretch it and flip it. Um, and we get one element, we turn it into a row. So hydrogen is uh, down here. Uh, and you see Z equals eight means eight protons and that's oxygen. And so each row corresponds to a different element and that's our row for molybdenum. So if I look for where these molybdenum isotopes are made, well, the first ones, 92 and 94, are probably made in some kind of a supernova event. We're still trying to figure out where exactly, but it, it's definitely an explosive event and it's most probably a supernova event. The middle ones are made in what's called, I'll, I'll get to the processes later, but uh, we'll, they're made in what's called AGB stars or asymptotic giant branch stars. These are just regular stars towards the end of their lives. And then the 98 and 100 molybdenum, those are made again in explosive environments and most probably in events like the neutron star merger that I mentioned earlier in the talk. So we have to really dive deep and see where each isotope is made and not just the elements. And as nuclear physicists, we try to put everything on this chart of nuclei, so you'll see it a lot. And the uh, hosts here, let me borrow one of their uh, demos. And this is an example of a chart of nuclei that you can see over here. There's the color code or here the, the um, amplitude. Uh, we can change that depending on how, what we want to display. Up there, it's uh, half-lives or lifetimes, how long they live. Uh, so as you go far away, uh, these, are, these live a lot, a lot shorter. And the middle ones, the black ones, are stable. Um, this chart is it's called binding energy or mass excess. It's how uh, bound a nucleus is or how much energy will I get out if I break it. And so you see a structure, these are the lightest elements down here, and it goes all the way up here to the heaviest elements, and you see this structure where the binding is not very high at the middle, and it's very high at the, for the low and the high uh, uh, masses. And this tells you that if I get this nuclei down here and I do different kinds of nuclear reactions, I can get a lot of energy out, and this is exactly what's happening in a stellar environment. In the middle here, I'm starting to have some difficulties that I'll talk about later. And then up here, you start to get these fission uh, processes, and we use fission a lot for a lot of applications today, good and bad. Um, but this is, again, a place where you can get a lot of energy from nuclei. So this chart is our playground, that this is exactly what we use all the time. OK, so I want to go Again, a little bit of educational, it's the, the professor in me, but I tried to explain how this process has worked step by step. And I'll start with the simplest one. I cannot explain step by step every single process on th these astrophysical processes, but I'll start with the simplest one and you kind of get the idea of how things go or how the, just the way of thinking maybe. So I get a little piece of the chart of nuclei at the top. Uh, again, black are the stable isotopes, and we have hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. And we will assume that we start with an environment with only hydrogen, and our goal is to make helium. This is the very first basic step of this, it's called nucleosynthesis, the synthesis of the, uh, of the heavier elements. Um, so that's, that's what we're trying to do. We start with hydrogen. So let's say you, ha you are in an environment with only hydrogen. The easiest thing that you could have is those two hydrogens uh, or just two protons that fuse together. When they try to do that, I go to my chart of nuclei. Hydrogen plus hydrogen would move up, and it goes into an empty box. That means that that nucleus doesn't exist. 
or if we do make it immediately, we'll break back into two protons. And so we're kind of back to square one. We got absolutely nothing out of this reaction, and the world cannot really uh, do anything with it. Fortunately, nature figured out a different way of doing this, and that's a very, very rare process. It's, uh, it's what we call a weak reaction, um, where in the process of the two hydrogens fusing together, one of the protons is converted into a neutron. Again, it's hard to do, it's very rare, but it happens every once in a while. And when that happens, we go from the hydrogen at the top, whoop, sorry. We go from the hydrogen up to top. We didn't make helium yet, but we made some progress. We made hydrogen to a little bit heavier hydrogen. We made a little bit of progress. Now, this takes a very long time. And this might be, this is one, there's many reasons, but this is one of the reasons we are still here to talk about it. If the rea this reaction was fast, then our sun would have burned all of its hydrogen right away and explode immediately, and we wouldn't be here to be talking about this. But because this reaction is so slow, it takes our sun 10 billion years to burn its hydrogen. And so very slowly it's burning, and it will keep burning for a few more billion years, and we don't have to worry about it. So uh, then the rest is actually easier. This was the hardest part. The rest is easy. Once you make hydrogen 2, which is there, it's called deuterium. Uh, there's so many hy uh, hydrogen nuclei in the environment, it grabs another one and makes helium-3. So there, we made our helium. Uh, and helium-3 is up there on the chart. Actually, this is a whole cycle, and it's called the proton-proton chain, and it continues with making more helium-3. I won't go into too much detail here, but it makes more helium-3. The two helium-3 fuse together and make helium-4, and that is the most stable nucleus in the whole chart, and that's why we like it, and uh, that's why there's so much of it. But you get the idea, we slowly look at what kind of reactions could happen. If they happen, what kind of energy is produced, what kind of new nuclei are produced, and we go from there, slowly, step by step, through the whole stellar environment and through the whole chart of nuclei to make all of the elements. So that's, the, that's kind of the story. And again, we like to put everything on our chart of nuclei, and this is uh, the larger version where the circles, the yellow circles there indicate different processes that are called burning processes. And I'll go back to this chart uh, that we have here. This is how you get energy from the light elements and it goes all the way up to iron. If you remember on my first slide, I had a little peak around iron and iron is special because up to iron, the reactions that are happening in the star produce energy. And so you can still have efficiently pro uh, energy production in stars, and it goes up to there. At iron, uh, they stop producing energy. We need to spend energy to make anything heavier than iron. And that's why the whole process stops there. And when you're making or you react on these lighter elements, they kind of all end up at iron, and that forms a peak there. To go to heavier nuclei, we cannot do it through this uh, fusion reactions or getting hydrogen and fusing into helium and more helium interacting and so on, you need something else, something that doesn't have charge. That is the key word here. If you know things that have charge, if they try to get close together, they will repel. And so nuclei do have charge, and as they try to go close to each other, they will, uh, they will again repel, so you have to spend more energy trying to fuse them together. And that's possible with the lightest nuclei, but if you go to heavy nuclei, the Coulomb force, this repulsion uh, wins, and then you cannot have this fusion anymore. So the way to overcome this is through neutrons. If you have an environment with lots and lots of neutrons, neutrons are neutral, so no charge, no Coulomb force to worry about, and they just uh, dive into the nucleus and they cause these reactions, and that's how you go and form heavier nuclei. And these are the processes I had earlier on the slide. If there's a, an environment with not too many neutrons, it's a, called a slow neutron process, S process. If it's an environment with lots and lots of neutrons, it's called a rapid neutron process or R process. There's another one up there that I won't talk about, the P process, it's kind of different, and it only makes 35 isotopes. Uh, but uh, we'll focus on the neutrons for now. And actually, I wanted to focus on the R process. That's, um, 
That's one of the big open questions in the field. How are the heavy elements made through this R process? And the reason that it's, so, it's still an open question is a pure, not pure, but it's strongly a nuclear physics problem because the nuclei involved are out here, very far from the stable ones, and we just don't have access to all of them in the lab. And I'll show you in a few minutes what, does, what that looks like and why it's so hard to do. Okay, so let's take a look at another connection. I love connections between these nuclei and stars. I like these connections. This is one of my all-time favorite plots. This has, again, the chart of nuclei at the bottom, and the line, the pink line that you see is this R process. How does the R process uh, proceed on this chart of nuclei? At the, the blue line is, would be the R, uh, S process that goes right along the stable isotopes. And at the top, I have a fraction of that abundance distribution I showed you in the beginning. Uh, so it's abundance of the elements versus mass number, how heavy these isotopes are. So if you look at the, the R process, for example, the reaction flows like that, and then it finds one of these vertical lines, and it kind of stays there. These vertical lines correspond to what we call in nuclear physics magic numbers. Uh, it's a weird name for a <laughs> physics <laughs> term, but that's what we call them. Uh, that was actually a Nobel Prize in 1963 uh, for the discovery of how, or the explanation, interpretation of magic numbers. Um, so what this means, magic numbers, are uh, if a nucleus has that number of neutrons, it just likes to stay like that. It doesn't want to change. It doesn't want to add more neutrons. It doesn't want to remove any neutrons. It just likes to stay like that. It's more stable. So as my reaction in the astrophysical environment, as all the reactions are happening, and it's actually a big mess, it's not as simple as I showed earlier, uh, it's a big mess, lots and lots of reactions happening, but then you meet one of these magic numbers and it just likes to stay there. So it stays a little bit longer until at some point, well, the whole event has to proceed and at some point it gets out and then it finds another magic number and it stays there for a while again and then it keeps going. Well, this staying there means that there's a lot of mass accumulated in that area. So as soon as the event is done, this accumulated mass will translate into uh, more isotopes of that type of mass. So this uh, neutron magic number right there forms a peak in my abundance distribution. And that exactly is the connection I was talking about that I love. It's a, a basic nuclear physics property. It's a, a nuclei having this magic number, and that translates into a peak in the abundances we see in our stellar observations, either in the solar system or even outside the solar system. And this is a one-to-one -one correlation that is just amazing to think about. Um, if you look at the S process abundances, which is the blue line up there, the same thing happens. It's just that the S process will find the magic number at a, a little bit heavier masses, and so my S process peak in the abundance distribution forms a little bit um, higher. Again, same reasons and same interpretation. So this is what we're trying to do. It's one of the examples why in nuclear physics we're trying to learn about the basic nuclear properties of these nuclei and then see how they affect the stellar environment and going back and forth to learn about that. So let me show you a little movie of how all of that that I've been talking about uh, looks like, uh, just to get an idea. You, don't, you won't get new information, but just observe how matter accumulates right around the magic numbers the color code is how many nuclei you have, so the more red, the more nuclei you have. So yeah, you see how those nuclei just accumulate around the magic numbers, and when the whole event is over, and you're slowly decaying back to form the stable isotopes, that forms these red regions, which are the peaks in the abundance distribution we, see, uh, we saw before. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, these are the kind of movies that, uh, astrophysicists will do, and then we'll take them and say, okay, which nucleus should I go and measure? Which nucleus will have an impact? I don't want to spend my career measuring something that is useless, so we definitely have to have this input and the connection with astrophysics. Okay. Maybe needs to stop. 
Okay, so before diving into a little bit of the experimental uh, ways of doing this, let's just take one second to see what exactly are we trying to uh, measure. What's useful? So what I'm trying to do here is just grab a chart, uh, part of the chart of nuclei, and I zoom in and I say, let's say this is my R process path. It finds the magic number right there, and so that's why it changes. But this is my path. So what, what's happening, if you look at it in, even closely, even more closely, is that there is, this is an environment with lots and lots of neutrons. It's an explosive environment. So the easiest thing for the nucleus to do would be to capture a neutron. And so this is one of the reactions we're trying to measure. It's called the neutron capture, or, or N gamma. So this would mean it captures a neutron and it shoots out uh, gamma rays out or light out. And it would move that way on, on this chart. Another thing it could do is decay. And this beta decay is just the converting one proton into a neutron, like what we saw earlier with that PP chain, the proton-proton chain. And it will go that way. So you can see the competition between the two is what matters. If I go in the lab and I measure that this guy wins, the N gamma reaction wins, then I know that's where my flow goes, and I will just try, keep tracking that flow and then find the next competition and the next competition. If my beta decay works, uh, wins, then that's where the flow goes. And again, there's a, there will be other nuclei involved. And so this is the main, the most important uh, quantities to measure. Um, the more complicated things after the beta decay could also be a neutron coming out that I need to worry about. Uh, in certain environments, we could have inverse reactions happening. So it gets complicated very quickly, but it gives you an idea of what kind of uh, nuclear properties we're looking for. And then finally, of course, fission is important as this R process moves to very heavy masses like we have in the chart here. Once the R process uh, moves and goes all the way up here, then we have fission. We get a lot of energy from that. And fission just gets this nucleus and breaks it into two pieces and releases a lot of energy and a lot of uh, particles, neutrons and gamma rays and so on. So if you get this nucleus and break it into two pieces, it feeds this middle area and then the process continues and comes back up there and fissions again and comes back down here. And this is called the fission cycling. And it just produces more and more nuclei in this middle region. So this is another property we need to know and we need to measure. So this gives you an idea of what we're looking for. Now, the important thing here is that all of these nuclei that participate in this process are all very far from the stabilized isotopes. They're exotic. They only live for a second or two. They don't live that long. We have to make them in the lab and be very quick and study them before they decay and become something else. And this is exactly what we're doing at the lab at Michigan State University. It's, as you heard in the beginning, it's a unique facility. There are only, a hand, not even a handful, maybe three facilities in the whole, whole world that can do this kind of science, produce these very exotic nuclei all the way out here and study them so we can learn about these events. The goal of the lab is not just nuclear astrophysics. I'm focusing on this today, and that's my research. But we're learning a lot about these nuclei and their properties, and there could be, uh, they could be used for other applications. I'm focusing on astrophysics today. So I'm sorry about the <laughs> Spartan helmet. <laughs> I had to do something. Um, you probably don't want to know, but you know where <laughs> Michigan State is. Uh, it's not very far from here. Um, but that's where our facility is. It's a large lab. We have over 100, uh, 850 employees right now. About, let's say, 250 or 300 are uh, scientists, nuclear scientists or accelerator scientists. A lot are engineers. Um, and then we have everything that you need to make a lab uh, work, a, a design group, a machine shop. We make everything that we can in-house. Um, this is our um, science group. We have 45 faculty, and that's, again, nuclear and accelerator science. We are separate from the Department of Physics. Uh, we have uh, about 45 postdoctoral researchers, about 120 graduate students, again, doing research in this, uh, in this area. So in nuclear physics, we are the number one pro graduate program in the country. Um, and a lot of undergraduate students working there, uh, either for summer programs or during the, the school year. Um, you can see it's very hard to get beam time. 
uh, at the lab. No, I'm just joking. This was just, a, uh, this was just an open house. So every, every two or three years, we do an open house. You're, uh, you should come if you can. Uh, or you should come for a tour. We offer tours every day. Um, you should come see the lab. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting to see. But yeah, when we have an open house, there's a lot of interest from the local community. And we get about 4,000 visitors in a day, which is really exciting for us to share our science. OK, so the current facility has uh, runs with two cyclotrons. And that's how we produce those rare uh, isotope beams, or these exotic beams. And so I'll guide you through the process a little bit. And then I'll tell you how the new facility will do it, how effort will do it. So these are our two cyclotrons. You start with some stable beam that you can find easily. And you accelerate it through the first cyclotron, then the second one. And it goes at about 50% the speed of light. Once it moves that fast, then you get the beam and you shoot it at some target. Typically, it's beryllium. And uh, as the beam hits the target, there might be some reactions happening. The reactions that typically happen are fragmentation. So the beam will just literally just break into pieces, and we collect one of those pieces. And so the end part you saw there was we have big magnets, magnetic and electric fields, and we guide the beam. And we also separate out the ones we don't want from the ones we do want to do our experiments with. Now, to show you a little bit, I'll encourage all of you, if you want to try it after the talk, you should come and try it. But we have here, uh, I have a Home Depot version of our accelerator. <laughs> um, so, but it's, the, it's very nice to just have a, a visual of how things work. So this is my accelerator. You can give it a little bit of energy if you throw your nucleus at, over here or even more, and I have an extra piece, but I can't reach that high. Um, and I have my nuclei, so this would be my beam. It's a carbon-12 nucleus in this case. We can accelerate anything from hydrogen to uranium. So this is one of them. It's carbon-12. Uh, it has six protons and six neutrons. And in there, you see it with the camera, there's another carbon-12. And so what, what would happen is that I will smash one of my carbons onto the other carbon, and hopefully, out of the things that are coming out, something will be one of these exotic things I want to try. If it's one of the stable ones that we know everything about, we'll just try again. And the way this works is that we'll have billions of these carbon nuclei every second smashing on our target. And so you just play with statistics. Mo many of them will be uh, boring, but some of them will be these exciting ones that we, we want, and then we have to separate them out. And I'll show you how we do that, too. But for now, let's just see how this works. Here's my carbon. Put it in and smashes on the other carbon. And then what came out is this. So now I have two protons. The yellows are protons, in case you were wondering. Um, and, the th the, and three neutrons. And I go to my chart of nuclei, which is too small to see here, but you saw other versions before. But I have two protons, so that made helium. And I have three neutrons, so that would make helium-5. And helium-5 is an empty box here, which means that immediately, as soon as I make it, it will shoot out one of its neutrons and become helium-4. But I can grab that extra neutron in my experiment, and I can learn something about helium-5, even if it's not even on the chart, and even if it doesn't live for so long. And this is how we do experiments. We try to make something that is exotic, and the color code on this chart is how these different nuclei decay, and then I know what to expect. Uh, or if it's a new one, I don't know what to expect, and I have to study it and explore. Um, and then we learn everything we can about them. And sometimes they're useful for many applications, medical applications, uh, many different things. And sometimes they're not useful for our lives right now, but these are the nuclei that participate in, in that stellar environment I'll be talking about, and this is how we learn about that environment. Let me do it one more time, and then we'll stop playing and go back to the top. I just want to, hopefully we don't make the exact same one, but I just want to, to show you the statistical um, the probabilities of these things. So here it goes again. So now I made something very different. Now this one is five protons and one neutron, quite exotic. So five protons is boron. And uh, total particle six, so it's boron six. It's not even on the chart. I don't think anyone has discovered it yet. <laughs> Something pretty cool. 
<laughs> so yeah, feel free to come after the talk and, and play with this. This is why we have it. It's one of our favorite demos. Okay, so let me show you a little bit uh, how this, the, the game uh, version, how it looks like in, with real data. Um, so we have our two cyclotrons that you saw on the previous slide and uh, you see where the production target is and that's where this reaction is happening, the fragmentation reaction. Um, and so what comes out of that reaction is a big mess. It's in this particular example, I have a Krypton uh, 86 beam, there's up there, um, and my goal in the experiment would be to make nickel 78. And it shows you where nickel 78 is. But nickel 78 comes with a lot of friends. And I cannot actually do an experiment with something like that. The, the very intense, the blue region there, the very intense uh, um, isotopes that we, I have that are not nickel 78 will just kill my detectors. And as an experimentalist, I really, I'm telling you, I cannot do an experiment with that. Um, but we have this fancy separator, which is, again, electric and magnetic fields. And so as we go through, some of these guys, the selection is based on their mass and based on their charge. And so some of these guys will not make it through. So if I go halfway through the separator, already I got rid of a lot of these uh, isotopes. And it's still not clean. I may be able to do an experiment with that. But fortunately, our separator keeps going. And at the end, I end up with this picture. So now nickel 78 comes with two or three other isotopes next to it, and that is something I can do in my experiment. The experiments are very sensitive. The whole process of starting with the cyclotrons, producing these isotopes here, and getting it to my experiment takes a few nanoseconds. That is a very, very short time. Um, the beam has enough energy so that I can put detectors in the path of the beam, and I can use it as a diagnostic, so I can tell exactly, event by event, nucleus by nucleus, what its properties are, how long it took to get from one point to the next, what its energy is, how much energy is losing, um, and then separate it from all of its other neighbors and study its properties. And this is exactly what we do with this kind of beams. Um, then once you produce the beam and you separate it out and you want to do your experiment, you can do a million different experiments. And I showed you what kind of experiments we're looking for. We're looking for the decays. We were looking for the reactions. Um, we're looking for the mass so we can make the chart, this chart. Um, we're looking for all of these properties. And we can do that in many different ways um, uh, in the lab. And I don't, I, if you come for a tour, I will show you all of this. Right now, it probably doesn't mean much other than there's a lot of pieces of equipment. But we can do experiments with these very fast beams, the 50% of speed of light. And so there's an area in the lab where we can do that and here. Or we can get these beams. For some experiment, you want the beam to move, to move very slowly, um, especially if you want to measure its mass. You want to put it in a trap, and then you don't want to, to move very fast because you want it to, to be able to trap it easily. Um, so many different applications, and that we do in the slow beam area. And there are certain astrophysical environments where you need uh, to have a specific energy. You translate the temperature of the star to energy in the lab, and you go from one to the other. And those energies are not the 50% speed of light I'm talking about, are a little bit lower. And so that's why we have this re-accelerator area where we get beams exactly at astrophysical energies. And that's this, uh, this red region up there. So we do many, many different kinds of experiments. I'm happy to talk about any of them later, but I didn't want to, to go into details about any of them. Now, with the cyclotrons, what we can do is we measure a lot of different isotopes. And again, a chart of nuclei, it shows you where this R process path is. And what we do right now is the blue or darker color region up there. That's where, the, where we can reach with the cyclotrons. The problem is that this R process path is not quite on the blue, or the blue area is not quite on the R process path. It's a little bit further away. And that's a problem because it means we're not studying exactly the nuclei that participate in the R process, we are starting a little bit off. It's still useful, uh, and it's useful for other events as well, don't, don't get me wrong, but it's, we really want to go onto the R process path, and that's why we're building this new facility. 
EFRIP, or the facility for rare isotope beams. So this is a very large project. It started in 2008, and it's a DOE-funded, DOE Office of Science-funded, and State of Michigan-funded project. Um, and you see the amounts up there. Um, and, the, and, and as I said, we've been uh, building it for a, a decade now, and it will be ready. It's almost very close. We'll be ready in a couple of years, and we are very excited. I mean, the community all over the world is really excited because this is going to give us access to nuclei that nowhere else in the world you can have. It's, uh, it's always a competition with new facilities. Uh, with the, the cyclotron facility, we were at the top for a while. Now the Japanese beat us, and we are behind. Um, but with EFRI, we will be at the top. And it will be the most powerful accelerator for rare isotopes in the world and make the strongest beam. And what this means is that it will make isotopes that we cannot make with the cyclotrons. Or it will make isotopes that we can make with the cyclotrons. It will just be a lot more and we can study them a lot better. And these are the two main things we're looking at. So, again, to see what EFRIB will look like, I have a little movie. It's much easier than uh, pictures. And I will guide you through. So EFRIB is uh, built in a tunnel underground. Cyclotrons are on uh, the surface. But EFRIB is in a tunnel underground. It's a linear accelerator instead of being uh, cyclotrons uh, or, and going around. And it's in a paper, paper clip um, shape. So this, the, the idea is the same as with the cyclotrons. You get a stable beam. It has lots of electrons. You strip out some of its electrons because then it's easier to accelerate. And so this is the process you see up there, stripping out the electrons. And then you accelerate it. The, it's again going to go about 50% of the speed of light a little bit faster and just makes it easier to make all of these isotopes. And you see how it goes, the paper clip shape. It starts in the middle and it goes around twice. And then it will go and hit a target, like we had with the, with the cyclotrons before. And when it does hit the target, what comes out is not the same every time. You have a whole distribution, and out of, of that whole distribution, you have to choose the one or ones that you want to study. And so this is the, the process of the interaction with the target. You see there are many different things coming. Others are bigger, others are smaller. And when they go through the, the, the separator, those magnetic and electric fields, the ones that have the wrong mass or the wrong charge, they just get bent too much or too little. And the ones that have exactly the right mass and charge, they will just keep going straight. And this is an example of an experiment uh, where we would just implant them somewhere and look for their decay. This is just one example. And it happens that they chose my detector for that, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, but yeah, this gives you an idea of what EFRIB uh, looks like and what more it will do. And I wanted to just go back and highlight that because I didn't highlight it. Um, so what EFRIB will do is this darker orange line. So it gives you access to a lot more nuclei that we've never seen before. We have no idea what their properties are. We have no idea even if they exist. Um, and we'll be able to discover new nuclei, we'll study their properties, and most probably we'll find surprises that I cannot tell you right now what they are. It always goes like that with research, but we know there will be surprises. We've, we've had them before. 30 years ago, there were, uh, we discovered nuclei down here that have this weird shape that it's like a, having a halo instead of just being the compact nucleus that we have, uh, that we imagine at least. All of a sudden, one of its particles would live very far away and kind of just orbit around, and that was a huge surprise. Um, and theory would have to, uh, didn't predict it and we have to explain it later. So there are always surprises and this is what we'll get with EFRIB. And so you see how far out it goes and for the specific astrophysical process I've been talking about, it's really exciting because the first time we'll have access to this nuclei and we've never had that before. Okay, uh, let's skip that. And that's basically what I had if I want to, to summarize I hope I showed you just a little bit, a little flavor of the field of nuclear astrophysics and what we're trying to achieve and how really exciting it is to try and combine the, the basic knowledge of nuclear science with uh, understanding how stars evolve and how they work and how they make the elements we see around us. And I hope I showed you how uh, 
cool our accelerators are and our facility uh, is. And it's not a very long drive, it's just one hour away. Even if it's Michigan State, you should still come uh, and see it and take a tour. Thank you very much.